want to talk to you about chemistry. Chemistry, in the public opinion, very often has a negative reputation. Toxic spills, environmental disasters, that's what we associate with chemistry. And I'm a chemist. And I'll actually tell you that the sort of things that you use and do in chemical practice are very often hazardous and not trivial and dangerous. But I don't want to talk to you today about how dangerous chemistry is. I want to talk to you about our path on building and creating chemistry that's safer, that's cleaner, and that's actually more efficient than what we have right now. But before we talk about this, I need to give you a rundown about chemistry. What is chemistry? What you see behind me is a chemical equation. And it shows us that we have starting materials, we call them reactants, A and B, which undergo a chemical reaction shown by an arrow to form a product, C, which is what you want to make. And this kind of equation, formula, you see it in science literature, you see it in public press, movies, videos, there's always a formula, right? That's what chemistry is all about. And my problem with it is that it's simply not quite right. Think about A. It's a substance we are going to use. We are not simply going to take this A, let's say a red powder, and watch it react. What we are going to do is dissolve it in a hundred or a thousand-fold excess of a liquid which we call solvent. And this is how chemistry is really done. You dissolve A and B in a very large amount of a solvent. You mix these solutions and then you form C in that solvent. 90 to 95% of a chemical reaction is actually a solvent that doesn't do much but allow you to, allows you to mix compounds. Is that the problem? In the laboratory, it's not. But globally, chemical industry is estimated to use between 40 and 60 million tons of solvents that eventually are relegated to waste. What kind of waste? Many of these are hazardous in different ways. Flammable, toxic to number children. Greenhouse gases, which means they contribute to the heating of our planet. Explosive. So what can we do about this? Well, before I talk about that, let me illustrate this problem on not an abstract substance, but something you know very well. Copper metal. Copper is an essential part of our technologies. Electrical appliances, cell phones that you all have are based on copper. But how is copper made? Where does it come from? Like pretty much any other metal, it is extracted from rocks and minerals in the earth using chemistry which means we use solvents. And you can imagine that dissolving rocks is not something easily done. And very often it involves taking highly acidic substances, sulfuric acid, and flushing with them large heaps and mounds of rock, creating rivers and ponds that are highly acidic and contain high concentrations of transition toxic metals that are more or less efficiently extracted. And this is all fine as long as nothing goes wrong. But some of you may be aware that hardly two weeks ago there was yet another breach of toxic mining waste in Brazil, causing deaths of dozens of people and disappearance of hundreds. So, is this something that we can deal with? I said chemistry is done using solvents. And if we want to help, we need to think about why do chemists use solvents in the first place? Who told them to? Well, one of the stories I found goes back to the ancient philosopher Aristotle, who was very popular two and a half thousand years ago and later on became a dominant philosopher in the early, early Christian world. And as such, his writings made a huge influence on the development of culture and science in early Europe. 
the ancient alchemists took on his idea that in order to achieve transformation, one should have a liquid. And for example, they dedicated a lot of their work to trying to develop a perfect solvent, one that would dissolve everything. They call it the alkahest, a substance that can be used for ultimate purification. And the efforts of early alchemists have found their way into modern chemical sciences, and this is, this tradition is why we use solvents. So if this story is true, that it means that chemists are using solvents simply because of a guy who died two and a half thousand years ago. Well, is there maybe then an alternative? And actually there is one. If you walk outside, take a walk through a forest, observe the rocks around you, you will see what is behind me, so-called lichens, microorganisms that do many interesting things. But for me, what is really interesting is that they very slowly are capable of extracting and using metals from rocks and soil they grow on by excreting so-called lichen acids. In a way, lichens are capable of achieving without using harsh chemistry, the sort of things that our metallurgy is achieving using sulfuric acid, nitric acid. So this struck me very much and I asked myself, is this something that you can do in a laboratory without light chance? And behind me is the first experiment we have done on this. It is a mixture of a model copper mineral mixed with oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is a very simple organic compound, and it is also a member of the lichen acid family. And simply by leaving this solid mixture sit on a bench for a week, you can actually observe a chemical transformation. You can see a change in color, formation of copper oxalate, which is not copper metal, but it's extremely easy to be used to extract copper metal. So, what else can we do with this? It turns out that this sort of aging chemistry, I call it the lazy man's chemistry, can be done very easily with a number of metal minerals. Copper, nickel, zinc, lead, you name it, we tried it and it works. And it actually works better if you keep these things in a moist and warm place. And what I particularly like about this is that this approach to chemistry can be easily scaled up, which means that you just need a larger dish. And I imagine that maybe one day, there may be industries making metals in places on Earth where you have warm, moist climates, India, Brazil, that will be performing the processes using this solvent-free and actually energy-free chemistry. Now, there is always a catch, right? And the catch is that sometimes this chemistry, this very lazy chemistry, is slow. And we need to think about how can we speed it up. And actually, it turns out that we can again go back to ancient inspiration because reactions can be done very quickly without using solvents by mechanically rubbing and grinding things together. Ancient peoples have found out they can perform all sorts of transformations, making fire simply by rubbing stones and rocks and trees. Ancient medicines were very often prepared by grinding together the components. So this is what our group is interested in. We call this mechanochemistry, chemical reactions which are enabled not through using lots of solvents, but through mechanical action. We want to get rid of this stuff and replace it with something else. How? We are not going to be rubbing things manually, no. We're gonna use one of these. This small thing here is what we call a milling jar. Inside we have a small ball and imagine there is a chemical substance, a reactant in there, A and B. And then we do this.
That's called ball milling. And the way we do it is not manually, but by using a mechanical mill shown behind me. And what you can see in this case is a very fast chemical transformation as our A and B turn into an orange substance. So this solvent-free chemistry not only exists, but it can also be very fast. What can you do with it? Well, you can try to make different materials. I mentioned about, mentioned to you copper. Well, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about gold. Everybody loves gold, and they love it because gold is precious, noble, and very stable. Excellent for making persistent, long-lasting jewelry. But that's also the curse of gold, because if you want to process gold, you need to dissolve it. What will dissolve gold? It's been known for centuries. There is one liquid that will dissolve gold. It's called aqua regia, in Latin, royal water. It's a substance that's a mixture of concentrated nitric and hydrochloric acids. Extremely nasty stuff. And still today, a large fraction of gold recycling and manufacture uses aqua regia. There are alternatives, of course. One of the alternatives uses, for example, chlorine gas, which is also a very nasty thing, or sometimes explosive peroxides. What I'm trying to say is that no matter how much you want to be cleaner and more efficient with gold, processing it and other noble metals, like palladium or platinum, is difficult. So we said, what if we do it solvent-free, mechanochemically? And what we try to do is mill gold and platinum and palladium with a mixture of solid reagents, which are quite safe, actually. And the result is behind me. We converted them into soluble compounds that can be used for further processing. But not soluble in aqua regia, soluble in plain old water. What else can you do with this sort of mechanochemistry? I believe that you can do anything. For example, pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceutical industry is craving for cleaner and safer ways to make drugs that help people. And our group, for example, has shown that you can use this mechanochemistry to make complex organic compounds like glibenclamide, which is one of the previously very popular antidiabetics. And a group in Montpellier, we are not alone, has shown how you can make a complex oligopeptide, leoencephaline, using only solvent-free methods. Indeed, I believe that you can do anything using mechanochemistry, not only drugs and medicines, cosmetics, polymers, dyes, pigments. I would say that anything that has so far been done using the same old chemistry can be done in a cleaner and a safer way through mechanochemistry. And I honestly hope that watching this presentation will inspire you to think about this and pursue this goal too. Thank you very much. Yeah.